Let both grow together until the harvest. The Lord be with you. We are reading from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 to 43. At that time, Jesus put another parable before the crowd, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seeds in his field. But while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So, when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servant of the householder came and said, to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then has it weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bide them in bundles to be burnt. But gather the wheat into my barn. Another parable he put before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of the seeds, but when it has grown, it has the greatest shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air came and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till it was leavened. All these Jesus said to the crowds in parables, indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came up to him saying, Explain to us, the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed means the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age. 
and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burnt with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sins and all evil doers, and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. The Gospel of our Lord. Today, I, I want us to pick, I want us to pick from where we left on Sunday, because it is like a chain of sorts. Today's theme is a lenient God, a lenient God. Where did we start, stop on Sunday? On Sunday we said, we must get busy, busy sowing and busy growing. Please don't forget that. Busy sowing and busy growing. Today you realize, I think something happened and we, were, we did not become busy. And therefore, today there is the concept of sleep. Remember we also discussed sleep the other time and what it means to sleep in God and to rest. So, in the first reading today, we hear the following words being addressed to God. And as I have said, that today's message is largely centered on the leniency of God. These words we hear from the book of Wisdom, chapter 12, verse number 17. Although you are sovereign in strength, you judge the mildness, and with great forbearance you govern us, for you have power to act whenever you choose. This is true, good people, because God has got the power to do whatever he wills, but at several moments he had chosen to be lenient with us sinners. The leniency which God displays towards us is not weakness, but simply an opportunity for us to be saved. It is actually a period of grace. When he takes time, even when we are so difficult, it is because he is giving us a chance to be saved. It is, as it were, a moratorium, a grace period for us to look back and say, enough is enough. I have been in this darkness for days without end. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we have constantly been taking God's patience for granted. And St. Peter emphasized when he said, Think of the Lord's patience as your opportunity to be saved. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Every time we do our walk with God, we are reminded because many will be the moments of falling. God is always waiting for us, as we read uh, in Luke 15, that all those of us who have proven to be prodigal children, our loving Father, our lenient Father, is waiting for us. We have been given a moratorium, 
And in this moratorium, we must make a decision. A decision to either turn around and go back to him or completely we get lost. And I don't want to think that any one of us would be ready for that. And on the flip side of the same, for those of us who are dealing with the difficult and toxic people, we are learning something from God that we too also must be lenient and patient. Some of the people we love will take long before they come around. They will take long. In fact, there are those who will not come back. I keep saying, I keep telling, uh, especially our great parents, this sad truth. You may have spent all your life praying for your son to be a man of substance. But there are those parents who went to the graves having not seen that realized. That does not mean that your prayers got lost. Maybe it is your prayers that sustained your son that he didn't die. It is you who died leaving him, though he may not have been a well-behaved fellow, but you prayed for them. There are those who take longer than we expected. Maybe you have a child who is becoming so difficult, and you're asking, when will my daughter behave? When will my son behave? Don't mind. Keep praying. Keep trusting. Keep hoping. Do not sleep. Please do not sleep. Because the devil will take that advantage. And I can tell you, in God's good time, in God's good time, your daughter will be able to come back home. Your son will come back home. Your husband will come back home. Your wife will come back home. Your friend will come back home. I want to speak this morning to those who are separated. Whatever happened, happened. And you give yourself again a grace period. May this period that you have been separated be a moment of reflection. It is a moment of grace. Please do not squander this moment. Please wait for each other. And I want to encourage you, if you are losing hope, that I've been waiting for my husband telling me that we come back together. I've been waiting for my wife to tell me to come back together. Please don't. There is always God's time. Remember, go back and address the reason why you separated. To some people, it may have been such a devastating moment that healing may have taken such a long time. Please be patient. Please be. Our prayer would be that in God's time, in the fullness of time, you'll come back together. Did you know I once celebrated mass in a family where the couple were coming back together after 19 years of separation. Another one after 11 years of separation. Another one after 7 years of separation. Some, some separations take a lot of time to come back together. Depending on the injury that was meted on the persons before they separated. Please, do not forget what could have precipitated your separation. And if you have taken the, the moment of healing positively, when you come back together, you'll be more strong. As of now, if you are still separated, I ask you, continue being patient. But I want to pray, please do not make your separation eternal. There is nothing like eternal separation. Leniency and patience is what we pray for you this morning. That in our time and in God's time, you'll come back together and you build your family. My prayer for you. The parable of the weeds in today's gospel better explains God's patience and tolerance in giving us a chance to grow up in his words. 
The tragedy is we have Christians who are growing in more, all manner of aspects, but we are not growing up in his word. That is exactly what we are being told in the gospel today. As any gardener knows, weeding can be the greatest threat of all to the life of the young seedling. At first, the problem is one of identifying which is which. The weeds must be left until the seedling can be clearly recognized. Even then, removing the weeds may pose an even greater threat. It might savor the seedling's root system. It might spoil them. Often, the weed brings the seedling away with it. At the, at the best of time and God's time, a separation will happen. But then, we may need to ask, what do we need to take home out of this parable? This parable teaches us some seven lessons. And I want us to have these lessons as what we can take home today. Number one, in the professing church, there will always be the wheat and the weeds. In our churches today, there will always be the wheat and the weeds. In the church, we are mixed. Today, as it is, we start going to church and we thank God. We may be just a hundred in the mass that is going on, or even few. But remember, in that congregation, you are mixed. When you see yourselves full in your church, that does not mean that all of you are headed for the glorious heaven. No. There are those who have other funny intentions. No wonder Karana would like to call us redeemed sinners. We are in church, but some, some are not yet redeemed because they have no intention to do that. Failure to recognize this has often led God's people to become discouraged and to be heartbroken because you thought that somebody you worship together cannot cause you pain. But did you know, today we have so many people who are so broken and their hearts were broken right inside the church. Also, those who are not Christians because they have not recognized that the wheat and weeds grow together. They have stumbled when they have seen inconsistency in the lives of those who profess to be Christians. In every church, there are children of God, please note that, and the children of the enemy in every church. In every church, there are children of God. You may want to read John chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. And children of the enemy, John 8, verses 38 to 45. And these people are both lay and ordained ministers. So you find them mixed in church. The other day, somebody was complaining to me that their church leader is in a funny group and it's like they are conning people and selling hot air in terms of properties. So this lady asked me, Father, Kwani pastors are con men. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But all I know is that in church, there are people who are hiding in church, but they are criminals. Some are criminals investments, unfortunately. We have had, in fact, even when we had things like pyramid schemes and many other schemes that we have in the world, many a times we have had them, we have had pastors and priests in those configurations. So, if you are in a church where you are wondering why this is happening, please know that in every congregation 
there are people who may not be going where everybody else is going. Unfortunately, some of them are our church leaders. And it is very sad, especially when people who are supposed to show us the way, they are not showing us the way, they are becoming con men in the church. Very sad. Number two, the devil's objective is to mix evil with good, to hinder the growth of the kingdom. The devil's objective is to mix evil with good, to hinder the, king, the growth of the kingdom. It all began in the Garden of Eden, if you remember Genesis 3.15. Since then, Satan and Christ have been in deadly conflict. The devil tried to interrupt the line through which Christ would be born. No wonder today we celebrate on the 28th of December the Feast of the Holy Innocents. When Christ was born, Satan tried to murder him. Matthew 2.16 In the wilderness, he tried to overcome him. Matthew 4, 1 to 11. Through his disciples, he tried to deflect him from the divine purpose. Matthew 16, verses 21 to 23. Finally, he saw him crucified, but praise God, the Savior rose again. And ever since, it has been Satan's aim to overthrow the church. Satan has been sowing bad seeds, weeds. And this explains the divisions, the false teachings, the heresies that exist in our churches today. Every time we hear churches fighting, we hear Sometimes you see them fighting. There are people who have their leader outside the gate, others inside the gate. The devil is active. And one thing I want to let you know today, that the devil never sleeps. Unfortunately, we are constantly sleeping. No wonder we are finding ourselves always on the receiving end. And then we are asking, how comes that uh, we are in the church and nothing seems to be going right? Simply because we slept. The enemy never slept. And when we slept, the enemy was not very far. The enemy was within. And I have shared with you in the past, there is nothing as dangerous as dealing with an enemy within. When the enemy is within the church, it is so tough because you never know where to hide. Maybe when you, when you, where you are seated in the church, the person next to you is the reason why you may never see a smile on your face. <laughs> Maybe. The person next to you could be smiling at you right now, but they are scheming to see you down. That is how sad it can be. Number three. The weeds look like wheat. So, we must never try to separate them in case we uproot or spoil the wheat. Remember, when we are in church, we go to church for different reasons. We join church groups for different reasons. Some are not there because of worship. Not everybody who is in choir is there to praise and worship. There are those who are there uh, maybe to get somebody. Maybe others are there to get a statement. Maybe others to get some attention. Not everybody who is in CWA or Woman Guild or whichever group of the church is there because of God. Some are there to make money, unfortunately. This is the reality. The good thing is, eh, all of them will grow together. A day is coming of separation. Do not separate them. In fact, I always say, Never annihilate an enemy because they belong to the owner. A day is coming. It is not very bad, by the way, to have an enemy. 
Sometimes I always say that it is good that even you are praying, pray that God may give you some enemies to keep you alert. <laughs> Unfortunately, our enemies are always with us. We may never know who our, our enemies are. In fact, nowadays, it is easier to know an enemy than a friend because they are more in our church groups than our friends. And I have also said, every time you are joining a prayer group, whether a WhatsApp, online, or whatever it is, please always know the composition of those groups and the purpose for which they were concocted. Because if we do not know, you may be entering into the slaughterhouse without knowing. The person who, whom you thought was your admin is a gelatine, gelatine master. It is the one who will see your neck <laughs> separated from the rest of your body, unfortunately. Number four, the weeds actually spoil the wheat. Every day, church groups are dying. You know why? Because in some cases, the weeds are very strong. Did you know the enemies of the church are always very influential, sometimes powerful, other times very loud? Look at every group that is fighting in the church. The day you will identify the enemy, you will never believe. A fellow who has a sweet tongue borrowed from the devil's archive. And this tongue, the person anakoroga watu, anakoroga watu, mnapigana, mnapigana, and the person in charge, nobody would ever even suspect. Because when we are on the wrong side, we become Christians bearing active seeds of death. And we have got in our groups in the church some of our Christians with very active seeds of death. That is why our groups are forever fighting. You go to any church in the world, there will always be a group fighting the other one. You fight that if it is the Catholic church. We have got the choir fighting the CWA or the CWA fighting the CME, or the woman guild fighting the other one. In every church, there is a group fighting. Either there is the intra-group fighting. Wanapigana wenyewe kwa wenyewe. Ata wamegawanyika. It is the same CWA, but there are three groups. It is the same CME, but there are three groups. It is the same choir, but there are three groups. And you realize sometimes why it is so sad. Sometimes our church leaders are sucked in this mess. You find that there is a choir that is fighting. And they are divided into groups. And every group has a priest in it or a pastor in it. So they become the, like the catalyst to keep the fire burning. There is a CWA group that is divided. Woman grid divided. There is a group of Father CK and a group of Father Joshua. You go to, you go to C, C, CMA or the Men Guild. <laughs> they are divided. There is a group of Pastor CK and there is a group of Pastor Minor or Pastor Musioka. <laughs> this is the madness we have in our churches today. Can you imagine? To the extent that some groups will not report their problems to a certain minister because they belong to another one. And we are not touched by that. But do you know why? Because of the word sleep. Underline that. We are coming back to that. Number five. While the sons of the kingdom are asleep, the devil's work prospers. Now I love that. When the sons of the kingdom are asleep, the devil's work prospers. I said, the devil never sleeps, but we are constantly sleeping. Our Christians are sleeping. Our church leaders are sleeping. The devil never sleeps. Now, 
how sleepy God's people have been through these 2,000 plus years. The church has had her share of problems. And one of the reasons we can attribute to the turmoils that the church has gone through, it is because Christians opted to sleep. Church leaders opted to sleep. The devil remained awake. That is why we, are, we have even some inner fightings. Inner fightings. <laughs> why? <laughs> you know, it is very sad because you know human beings are human beings. You find that even where we are supposed to be so cohesive, we are so divided and we are fighting. Let me share with you some signs of a sleepy church. Signs of a sleepy church. If in your church you have any of those two signs, please call for a crusade of deliverance because <laughs> you guys might be headed for death. Sign number one of a sleepy, a sleepy church, the absence of conviction of sin. Sin is not an issue anymore in that church. Anybody can do whatever they want to do and they, they are... They are um, they are sanctified, as it were, or sanitized. Nowadays, you're talking about sanitization. In our churches, our people are messing around, but the leadership is sanitizing them because maybe they are men and women of means. In the church, sins are categorized depending on who you are. So if you are the church donor, where, where, you have no sins. Whatever you do is sacramental and a heavenly attribute. <laughs> no. Number two, lack of the fear of God. Lack of the fear of God. Number three, watching pornography and feeling justified. Watching pornography and feeling justified. We feel it, it is okay. And then we, we say that, no, everybody is into social media and these things are happening. Mm -hmm. Number four, avarice, greed, and lack of financial integrity. Wheezy Kanisani. We are having harabes in our churches and then the money is diverted. Wheezy Kanisani. We, we ask money from the donors to feed the poor and then the money goes to build some properties for the priest or for the bishop or for the pastor or for the uh, uh, apostle or for the oracle or for the whoever. The money that was collected to feed the, the poor, the money that was collected to feed, uh, to educate the less privileged, that money added in the pocket of somebody. We did Harabe to build the church gates. But the money that was supposed to, be to, to build the church gate, it had to build some house in the priest village home. Mwizi Kanisani. <laughs> this is what is happening. Wizi Kanisani. Lack of financial integrity. The church is asleep. You realize that you go to some churches, there, is, there are no financial records. If you ask them, how much money do you, do you collect in terms of tithing per year? And then they give you some funny answers. Ah, you know in this church, uh, people are not, are not okay financially. That was not the question. The question was how much? But because <laughs> it is never recorded anywhere, it is collected and it is put in the pocket like tobacco. <laughs> No, please, you can't work that. <laughs> Number five. No sense of outrage over the church's lack of credibility in the world. The church lacks credibility. Nobody talks because to Kosawa. Number six. Little concern about the lack of knowledge of God's word. Biblical illiteracy is thriving, nobody is concerned to Kosawa. Number seven, indifference to the biblical view of marriage. That our marriages are dying in the church 
Our marriages are being broken by the people who should help them stand. Number eight, indifference to holding grudges and unforgiveness. There, and finally number nine, indifference to how much time is spent in prayer and quiet time. Time of prayer there isn't. We do not have seminars for prayer, seminars for the Bible. All the time that we are so busy in the church, it is when we are building. All the seminars we have are seminars about money. And I have said in the past, if you focus too much on the pocket, you lose the hearts. But if you focus on the hearts, the souls of people, God replenishes because that is his work. Unfortunately, our churches are busy preaching money, not walking in the obedience to the word of God, unfortunately. Now, while Christians slept, the forces of evil have gained ground. Today, we have sleeping parents, sleeping guardians, we have sleeping leaders in our government. We have sleeping teachers and instructors. We have sleeping religious leaders, bishops, priests, pastors, mention them. Everyone must not be asleep. We cannot afford to sleep. And we are talking about evangelization. Evangelization and sleeping are not intimate bedfellows. They have never been. So we must refuse to make them intimate and twins. Sandra, when we get to bed, when we go to sleep, the devil wakes up. In fact, he was never asleep. We must be busy. Remember how we started and how we ended last Sunday? We must be busy growing. We must be busy sowing. We cannot afford to sleep. As a church, today we are saying we cannot afford to sleep. Whichever church you go to worship, it, this is the day that we must say that as a church, we cannot afford to sleep because when we sleep, our church falls. Remember, a sleeping church cannot correct the government because, as I said, when the church sleeps, the devil gets busy. And the agents of the enemy, because they are within us and they are among us, they come and take advantage. Today, we have church leaders who have been pocketed by politicians. So they cannot correct the system because they are part of the rotten configuration. We have a problem. Number two, a sleeping church cannot correct the evils in the society. Why? Guilty as charged. A sleeping church cannot invest in professionals. Uh -huh. If you are in a church and you are a professional and you are always being seen and looked at suspiciously, then know that uh, yours is a sleeping church. A church that does not invest in professionals. Men and the women who are well trained, who can help the church grow, if your church cannot and does not value professionals, yours is a sleeping church. And very soon, my dear, we'll call your church a dead church. Because the church can sleep and eventually die. Why? Because the enemy at some point will subdue the church if nobody wakes up. A sleeping church cannot stand correction. A sleeping church is never corrected because the criminals are forever right. So you correct the, the leaders, you are, you are a declared persona non grata. Not because you are bad, but because you went to awake the sleeping church by correcting them. They are never corrected. A sleeping church thrives in blackmail theology. They will use the Bible to put you down. In our Catholic church, we've got canon law, a whole code 
big. There is one that even has that has that is this size. A big code, Sharia za Kanisa, with their interpretations. Sometimes uh, um, we may be priests who are always carrying the code of canon law because we want to pin people down. We don't want to preach the spirit of the law. But you go with the code of canon law, <laughs> you enter into the meeting of parish council with the canon law book. Asema, Sharia imesema. <laughs> you cannot be carrying the code of canon law everywhere <laughs> telling us that Sharia uh, imesema. Apana, listen to the people. They have some brains, my dear. They also went to school where you went. And some are more exposed academically than you. Please, thank you for understanding. You cannot be using the Bible every time to look at the verses where you put people down. And this is what mostly our ministers are doing. Across the, 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 the divide. When we want to ask money from our Christians, instead of teaching them faith, we use the Bible to blackmail them, calling them thieves. Munaibia mugu. Ha, na biguni. Haki seriously. Hata ni measia tu hapo, sita ogea tena. A sleeping church cannot connect with the people. There is always a great divide, like the one that existed between poor Lazarus and, and, uh, and the rich man. There was that great divide. A sleeping church has that divide. Christians are there, leaders are here. No connection. Unazikia viogozi wakansa wakiogea, unashidwa. Allah, these fellows, wanaichigi wapi? Because they are talking as if, they, I mean, their, their, their content is so utopic to the extent that you even wada. Do they even know what is happening down here? They cannot know because they are actually disconnected. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> if we go back to Lazardis, Homere, maybe they are medicinal fellows or diagnostic. Now we can say again that diagnostic Christianity and medicinal Christianity are sleeping Christians. Now you know. <laughs> A sleeping church cannot stand financial integrity. Did you know? The ideal church that respects the benevolence of people will always give them financial returns. And they are published even in their website. That your website is clear with how much we collected in tithing in 2019 and the sadakas and the harabes we did. And we give people bank bank statement they know that this is where our church is standing it is not proper for a church to treat people like fools no please publish the books of accounts and as a leader get away from that let a people come and own their church that is why in the catholic church we talk about the finance council, the finance council, so that the priest can be left to do the work of evangelization. Vatican Council II tells us that the cardinal duty of a priest is to preach the word of God, to administer the sacrament. Mijego yachiwe watu. Kununua magari yachiwe watu. You cannot be the preacher, the contractor, the, the bidder, the, the supplier, the everything. Aye, please. It is not right. <laughs> the devil also uses, this is very important for us to know, that the devil uses even natural catastrophes, to, especially those that instills fear to people to plant bad seeds. So, the devil is so much active whenever there are tragedies and catastrophes. And I can tell you for a fact that right now with this corona pandemic, 
a lot of evils are happening. Some fellows are so busy getting rich because of the problem. There may be a lot of evils going on, as we have said, in the church and the government today, right now. Corruption, and I can tell you that maybe in the world, corona might leave some people so rich than they were because corona time is looting time. Money that was meant for this, money that was meant for this, that when we, are, we have declared that the world is free of corona, there will be men and the women who will be billionaires. Not that there were some special funds from heaven that was given to diligent leaders. No, it is because they took advantage of lockdown. When we were locked down, they locked themselves in. Where there was money. For us, we were locked in where there was no food. <laughs> and the criminals continued looting. <laughs> this is very sad. Did you know that uh, this is the time that so many people will lose jobs? Because the best time to fire somebody is during corona. And you blame it on the meltdown. So many jobs, jobs layoffs. So many office swapping. There will be so many, so much evils. And in fact, even now, there is so much evils happening in the world. Talking about corona. Now is the time that we wake up. The night is far gone. Remember that the enemy is always awake, looking for an, an opportunity to sow bad seeds. Do not sleep. Number six, lesson number six. The solemn fact of judgment and of future retribution is certain. Catechism of the Catholic Church, Numbers 1005 to 1037, talks about the last four things. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. They are certain. It will come. And finally, number seven, the Lord Jesus will be victorious and will gather all his own together to be with him forever. That is the most assuring statement that we can take home today. The time of fearful separation is surely coming. Fearful for those who are mere churchgoers or professing Christians, but wonderful beyond words for those who are the Lord's. So, those who believe and are awake, victory is coming. My dear good people, those who believe and are awake, victory is coming. So, we must remain awake. We must remain awake. Remember, the devil never sleeps. So, we must remain awake because we know as it were, victory is coming. Thank you.